Good morning. I hope everybody survived DC's blizzard of 2013 yesterday. It's great how quickly the city got its act back together. You know, there's no snow out there now, so it's a great testimony to Washington, DC. I'm Darrell West, Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. And I'd like to welcome you to this forum on uh, mobile technology. And we are webcasting uh, this event live, so a warm welcome to our viewers from around the country and around the world. Uh, we will be archiving this video, so anybody who wishes to view it after today will have an opportunity to do so uh, through our brookings.edu uh, website. Uh, we also welcome any comments or questions that you have. Uh, we have set up a, a Twitter a feed at hashtag techCTI. That's hashtag techCTI. So if you wish to post any comments during the forum, uh, you are welcome to do so. By the end of this year, it is estimated that there will be more internet-connected devices in the world than people. Uh, mobile usage is rising rapidly, and wireless applications enable users to exchange information on healthcare, finance, transportation, education, and many other activities. Today, we're going to be discussing the nature of innovation and some of these new models of service delivery that are emerging, both in the United States as well as around the world. We will talk about how cities, states, and countries are using mobile technology to deliver services and help people. Uh, we will look at what progress has been made and what we can do moving forward in order to uh, uh, facilitate continued uh, development. And this event is part of our mobile economy project that looks at the impact of the mobile revolution in many different areas. We're going to have two sets of experts who will discuss uh, uh, innovation, invention, and the effects of mobile uh, technology. And to help us understand this subject, we're going to start with remarks from Dean Brenner. And Dean is Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at Qualcomm Incorporated. In that position, he directs the company's initiatives related to spectrum and telecommunications policy. Uh, he represents the company before the Federal Communications Commission and other uh, agencies. Uh, in addition, he's responsible for uh, global spectrum acquisitions and uh, strategy. So, uh, Dean, thank you very much. Good morning. On behalf of Qualcomm, I'd like to start by thanking Daryl and Brookings for researching and fostering discussions on the tremendous impact that mobile technologies are having on people and communities around the world. Qualcomm is very proud to support the Mobile Economy Project, and I'm, of course, personally honored to be a part of today's event and to hear from our distinguished panelists and all of you in the audience. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Qualcomm, we are the world's largest manufacturer of chips for cell phones and other wireless devices. We're also the world's largest ma uh, licensor of mobile technology because we license our technology to virtually every company in the world who makes cell phones, tablets, other wireless devices, or infrastructure equipment. This may be the only event in Washington today where you're not going to be told to turn off your cell phone. <laughs> uh, if, in fact, if you have a 3G or a 4G phone, and I suspect that almost everyone here does, uh, you're using our technology that we invented at our headquarters in San Diego and that then we shared with our partners who made the phone that's in your pocket. So for more than 28 years, uh, when Qualcomm was founded, um, the invention of mobile technology has been our central focus. Together with our partners, we've helped to enable people all over the world to use wireless devices to improve virtually every facet of life. Now today, there are approximately 6.7 billion mobile subscriptions around the world. A subscription means some people uh, could have two devices and there could be uh, machines that are used by companies that don't relate to a person. So there's 6.7 billion subscriptions, but which is really an astonishing fact if you think about it because the world's population is only 7.1 billion. So we are actually almost what Daryl said with one subscription, one device per person. So what we like to say at Qualcomm, and I think it's no exaggeration to say it, is that mobile is the largest communications platform in the history of the world, which is a gigantic statement. So in particular, there are about 2.3 billion 3G or 4G connections around the world. So as you're going to hear today, and as you just know from living, uh, the potential of mobile broadband 
to improve people's lives, to empower people across all socioeconomic classes is truly tremendous. Mobile technology is promoting opportunity and economic development all over the world, and that's why over the last year, Brookings has done a wide variety of research and very interesting discussions, all led by Daryl, on some of the areas where mobile is having such a profound impact, including microfinance, public safety, education, and healthcare. Today, you're going to hear about yet other areas, including the ingenious use of mobile technology to improve parking, yes, parking, from our great partner, Streetline, to conduct surveys, yes, surveys, from uh, M-Survey. As you'll also hear today, invention is crucial to making all this happen. At Qualcomm, we believe that invention in mobile technology can never stop. We invest a huge amount of money in research and development. So in 2013, we spent $5 billion on R&D, which is more than 20% of our annual revenue. So 20 cents for every dollar of revenue, not profit, revenue that we receive goes right back into research and development. Why do, we, why do we do that? We do that because we understand that making advancements in wire, wireless technology, inventing new technology, it's not cheap, it's not easy, but it's essential. And it's an engine that's not stopping. Our commitment to invention led us to commission a global survey on the topic. The Time Invention Poll, which you're going to hear more about today, conducted in cooperation with Qualcomm, asked people in 17 countries around the world about their attitudes and opinions about invention. And the results were truly remarkable. 40% of the respondents said that the digital revolution from 1980 through today was the most inventive period worldwide. 71% of global consumers said the cell phone is the most useful invention. Not only is digital technology felt to be an important end product of invention, but it's also seen to have made the invention process itself easier today than ever before. Over 50% of the respondents believe that inventions drive economic growth. And this is particularly true in emerging markets where consumer 59% of the respondents said invention supports a strong economy. And I think we all know this, as I say, from just living. Equally impressive, though, were people's perceptions of how important it is to protect the ideas that drive inventions. Globally, the United States is viewed as the gold standard in protecting intellectual property. 40% of global consumers said that the United States was the country that does the best job of protecting ideas. Invention is also seen as collaborative. While the inventor remains central, sharing ideas and working collectively is recognized to be positive for invention. At the same time, patents, which are core to Qualcomm's existence, are seen as crucial for the invention process. And in turn, protection of inventions is encouraging more invention. Now, this survey confirmed uh, a lot of what we believe here at Qualcomm, but the breadth and depth of the appreciation around the world for the invention process and the importance that consumers place on keeping these inventions going was striking even to us. Today, I hope will give us even more examples and insight into how the combination of ingenuity and the inventive spirit are leading to breakthrough advances in the use of mobile technology here in the United States and around the world in so many different ways. So at Qualcomm, we foresee great things ahead for the mobile industry, ideas and solutions that are addressing many of our most pressing global challenges, cutting edge mobile technologies that improve and Im impact social and economic development on a global scale and in tremendous ways. So I look forward to hearing the rest of today's event, and I hope uh, you all enjoy the day. Thank you. So while uh, these individuals are getting uh, mic'd up, uh, I want to thank Dean for those opening uh, comments. And it certainly is impressive, those device numbers that he was uh, talking about. I know in my household there are two people, and we have eight devices between my wife and myself. And it seems like every week uh, there's another uh, option that is appearing. Uh, we're going to move uh, to our uh, first panel, which is going to focus on the role of invention in mobile uh, technology. 
And the moderator for this uh, session is Michael Duffy, who is the deputy managing editor at uh, Time Magazine. Uh, Michael joined Time in 1985 as a Pentagon correspondent. He has covered uh, Congress and the White House and served as Washington Bureau uh, Chief, uh, Nation Editor, and Executive Editor of the magazine. He has written more than 50 Time cover stories. He's won the Gerald R. Ford Award uh, for reporting, both on the White House and on the defense and national security area. Uh, with a team from Time, he has shared in the Joan Shorenstein Barone Prize for Investigative Journalism, awarded by the Kennedy School of Government. Along with Time Managing Editor Nancy Gibbs, he is the co-author of two best-selling presidential histories. Uh, one is The President's Club, Inside the World's Most Exclusive Fraternity, and a second book, uh, The Preacher and the President's, uh, Billy Graham in the White House. And I also want to point out today is a particularly busy day for Michael. We're really uh, pleased that he took time out of his uh, schedule because you probably already have heard uh, Time today announced its person of the year uh, being Pope Francis. So we tried to get him for the keynote, but he was a little tied up. But great choice, Michael. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction. He is something of an innovator, so I did think about bringing him. But this panel is more about invention, which maybe when we have the reinvention panel, we'll bring the Pope. I will see. Um, uh, uh, thank you very much. My household, 10 people, uh, sorry, five people, 10 devices, um, and counting. It seems it may go up at Christmas. I'm not quite sure. Uh, no matter who we are, where we're from, we love a good invention myth, uh, and we're taught them from the beginning of our lives, whether it's uh, Newton and his apple, Archimedes and his bath water, buoyancy, displacement, or even Philo Farnsworth and his, his, his plow going back and forth across the field, which led to the idea uh, of, uh, for him for television. Uh, in the, uh, this is a, a powerful uh, idea that I think we all grew up with, which is how things start, how, where they come from, um, what makes uh, us think creatively, what, what, is it a spark or is it something uh, more collective, and is that changing? Um, I'm going to ask our two experts here to talk about that in a minute, uh, but first a couple of, of thoughts uh, of my own. Um, uh, I do think we're living in a kind of golden age of invention because for not just years or even decades, but centuries, there have been limits uh, uh, in terms of education and computation and sharing of ideas across borders. All of those barriers are disappearing, and they're disappearing in our lifetimes, and they're disappearing fast. Um, it's fairly recent. It feels to me like it's accelerating. Uh, and yet at the, pro at the core of the process of making things new or making things new again, um, uh, reinvention, um, uh, it's got to be, at some point, an individual act. Uh, and I want to explore that a little bit today uh, with our two experts. And I hope you guys can talk about that in your opening remarks or anything else you think is more relevant than what I've just laid out, which shouldn't be too hard. Uh, we have two uh, 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 great innovators here today. Um, John Villasenor is a senior fellow at Brookings. He specializes in data te data te digital technology, public policy, and the law. He's an affiliate at Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation and is a vice chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Intellectual Property System. Uh, he attended UVA and then went on to uh, get a master's and a PhD from Stanford, so he's an underachiever. <laughs> um, uh, also with us today is John Sauer, who's the communication chief for Water for People, which works uh, to ensure safe, affordable, and sustainable drinking water and sanitation for people around the globe. Uh, though John is with us here today, he's worked for more than 20 years in humanitarian projects from Russia to Uganda. He's a graduate of Fordham and uh, has a master's in international intercultural management from the School of International Training in Brattleboro. These guys are much smarter than I am. So I'm glad you are going to take the questions and I'm going to ask them. But before I do, um, if you could just talk for a few minutes uh, each, uh, and why don't you start, John? This John, the immediate John to my right, T. and John's then you can follow. Jesus. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you and welcome. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, so yeah, I think uh, we are indeed living in an age where uh, there's just a spectacular opportunity for, for invention. Um, one of the things I'd like to, to, I'd really like to say two kind of broad things. One is, is that uh, despite the incredible complexity of today's devices and systems, there's still a real role for the, the sole inventor, the, the in, individual innovator. And I'll give a, a very specific example of that. Uh, recently, a, a venture capital company I do some work for asked me to to visit a company uh, founded by a person uh, who's trying to invent a better microphone. 
And you might think, well, you know, is the, mic is the microphone market that big? Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and microphones aren't only the things that you know, singers hold uh, on stage. Microphones are in every tablet and every smartphone. In fact, uh, tablets often have multiple microphones. So the number of microphones that get sold uh, each year in the world is, is truly staggering, hundreds of millions or maybe pushing a billion. Hmm. Uh, and it turns out that, that the way most microphones today, including most of the microphones probably in your pockets and your phones, are they use a, a vibrating diaphragm. Basically, you, you, you vocalize, you vibrate the air, the, vi the di diaphragm vibrates. But uh, this gentleman um, has, uh, thinks you can do it with something called a piezoelectric uh, solution. Uh, and he has spent eight years doing nothing else. Um, and he did a PhD at University of Michigan doing it, and now he's started a startup company to try to commercialize it. And just uh, two months ago, he was awarded a US patent for his invention. Uh, and you know, it's too early to know whether his company will succeed. Um, but that, to me, is a, is a really important example of, of you know, the, the role of the single creative innovator and how um, we, we, we absolutely still need those people, and, and those people uh, can and will continue to change the world. The other uh, final comment I'll make is that one of the great aspects of, of inventions and innovation is that they have these incredible downstream consequences that, that could have been hard, very hard to predict, and uh, Qualcomm is, is, a, is a great example, uh, as a great innovator in mobile technology. Just some numbers uh, that you may, you may have one time I've known, but perhaps have forgotten. Back in the 1980s, the mid-1980s, the first car-based mobile phone solutions were offered. They cost about $2,500. Uh, that's back in 1985 dollars or four dollars. That's probably you know significantly more today. Uh, so on an inflation-adjusted basis, the cheapest uh, feature phones, non-smartphones, are now about 80 times cheaper. Uh, than they were uh, back in the 1980s. And mobile phones, which were in some cases criticized in the 1980s as toys for the very wealthy, of course, have literally changed the world uh, in every single corner of the planet uh, and have benefited uh, people really from every walk of life and at every level of the economic spectrum. And, and so um, those are some of the incredible consequences that perhaps even the original inventors of a lot of the technology behind mobile phones wouldn't have necessarily foreseen. But because of strong intellectual property protections and the incentives that go with them, uh, we really, uh, we collectively have, have changed, or those of us who have been involved in mobile technology and companies like Qualcomm have, have really changed the world. All right, so uh, John, do you want to follow, and then we'll take some questions. Sure. I, you know, I would sort of say that given the complexity of a lot of the intractable problems that we see out there, and I think you know the person of the year being Pope Francis, um, his whole push is to solve global poverty. I mean, if we look at those kinds of global poverty issues, to really solve those, I think the the kind of innovations or the kind of inventions that we're going to need to see are. are are going to be things that cross that cross silos. I think we we've tried to solve these problems in silos. You know, we've got the health community, we've got you know the the the, the agriculture community. Whereas the reality is, I think solving those issues, it's going to take really working across those lines to get, to get to the solutions that we need to do. Mobile certainly helping that. I mean, I, I can look at an example of our own sector, and, and I'm in the water sector, water sanitation sector, and we were faced with a problem that 30% of all the programs that are, are happening with water and sanitation are failing within two years. So what did we need to do? We, we, we went and we looked at the, the, the need to monitor, and to monitor effectively, we went and we looked at mobile because we and we put it we created a survey it's called aquo flow that survey tool that is on a android based phone and now that's how we do all our monitoring across across the world and without without taking so it's also i think integrating with the with the different technologies that are out there um, take take for example i i, I think we're seeing a, a big push to actually have that kind of that that type of integration and and this collective type of approach happening. You've got efforts such as Ashoka pushing issues like hybrid value chain work. You have uh, this great research coming out of uh, Stanford on uh, on collective impact and the work that's going on there. 
Now, these aren't inventions, but I think that we, we have to think of these things as all interrelated, and that if we can somehow in, in, in spur on invention that's taking into effect the ability, you know, the need for us to work across these silos, across these sectors to actually solve these big intractable problems, I think we'll start to, to get somewhere a little bit faster. So. John Villasenor, do you, can you talk to me a little bit about why mobile may or may not be a particularly um, uh, versatile uh, platform for, I mean, take us up about 10,000 feet first, you know, uh, why this might be a particularly versatile platform for uh, invention itself. Just what, what does it offer that perhaps other uh, breakthrough uh, uh, technologies don't, uh, as you look back, I mean, don't go too far back in history. We don't need to go to the wheel. But, um, but, but as, you, as, you, as you think about it, uh, both its potential and, and what it offers, um, w w just uh, talk to me about why this is, is a different. Well, place. I think mo mobile is fascinating because uh, mobile is an information portal, right? And so all of the, it really unifies uh, 20 or 30 years ago, we would have thought of you know, wireless communications as one field and computers as a completely different field, right? And it puts all of these things together, and then having done that, it gives us the entire power of the internet and all of this. So, so we have unified and accessed through one device um, something, things that 20 years ago would have been in three different silos, really. And, and so just because of the wealth of capabilities that you have in these devices, there's that many more opportunities opportunities to innovate. And can you talk also just a second about uh, where um, its applications uh, for data collection and um, uh, chewing on that data and analyzing it uh, take us to a different level just uh, because I think for most of us who really just use it as a device to communicate with our children, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, we only can glimpse uh, at this point, where that is, where that road is going. Well, I think yeah, that's a great question. I think many, many folks here may have heard of the, the phrase "Internet of Things," um, which is a term that's sometimes used to, to really talk about uh, a future where we're, we're, we're really sort of have, have already arrived at the beginning of that future, where where many objects, not just uh, personal communication devices, are equipped with mobile communications technology. So, uh, appliances, automobiles, environmental monitoring, sensors, a long, long list of things. And so, I think mobile. Uh, five or ten years from now certainly will still mean smartphones or whatever smartphones look like in five or ten years, but it's also going to mean a world which sort of comes alive with, with lots of devices that are processing data, acquiring information, uh, and you know, that's all aided, of course, by uh, advances in chip technology for acquiring all this information. Uh, and so I think there's an enormous, enormous number of possibilities there. Um, in the Time Qualcomm poll uh, that we did last month, um, we asked people from, I think it was 16 or maybe 17, 19 countries, I forget the number, it was a lot of countries, um, to list their, uh, the most valuable invention uh, in their lives. And, and while the cell phone totally smoked the field, um, there were some other interesting answers I want to share in order to get back to John Sauer. Um, uh, and they differ depending on where you live. I mean, uh, in rank of order after the, uh, your device that comes the disposable diaper, the alarm clock, Velcro, cruise control, and the rice cooker. Um, you probably have all of these devices somewhere in your house, even if you don't know it. Um, and there were some fascinating regional variations between those. Um, Germans feel nearly as strongly about the vital nature of Velcro as people in the United Arab Republic, United Arab Emirates, feel about cruise control. Um, <laughs> For more on this, you can, you can go look at the poll. I'm not sure you need to know more, uh, but it's there. Uh, John Sauer, uh, since this is a, that was a more practical answer to what sometimes can become a theoretical question, uh, someone who's working in water sanitation, uh, talk to me a little bit about the invention you'd most like to see, uh, if you could snap your fingers. I, I think you mentioned the sensor, John. I, I actually think there's been some interesting work done with sensors that could probably, you know, could be stepped up if, if sensors were really, really inexpensive, for example. So one of the things that uh, I, re I remember Unilever had done was they put a, they put a sensor in a bar of soap so that they could, they could monitor whether people were washing their hands or not. And of course, that didn't work exactly the way they had planned it because in the developing world, families often break the soap in half and then share it amongst different households and et cetera. So it, the, the sensors didn't do the job. Another uh, development that's happening r right now is there are sensors on 
people are putting sensors on toilet doors to see if people are actually using, using the toilet. It's, so there, there are some quite interesting things that could be done if the, these technologies, as they become cheaper, you know, even with the, the mobile phone, as the, as the Android phone becomes, uh, you know, now there's maybe a $50 Android phone, as it becomes even cheaper, then this ability to do more regular data collection becomes a lot easier because then people can, you know, they can have these surveys on their phones and they can actually be doing them on a, on a more consistent basis. So I, th I think it's, in some cases, it's not just the technology that's going to leapfrog, but it's actually the, the use of the technology because r if we look at the water sanitation sector, not everyone is monitoring as rigorously as some of us are. And to be really, to really address this problem, we do need to be monitoring that rigorously. Otherwise, we don't know, we, we don't know what's failing, why it's failing. We can't see what's working and why it's working and try to make better decisions based on that data. So it's really the use of the technology as well and, uh, that, that's, that's really critical. Um, one other point is, I think, the, the reinvention. Uh, if, you, if we think of the toilet, for example, um, actually an interesting poll in 2007 by the BMJ, formerly the British Medical Journal, um, of 11,000 of their readers said that sanitation had been the greatest invention in the past 166 years. Um, and that beat out uh, the antibiotics, for example. Um, and Velcro, so, apparently. And Velcro and cruise control as well. Um, although I do like my cruise control on my German car. <laughs> but I, I, th I think, but if we, if we then look, go back to, you know, 7.1 billion people on the planet that we heard, 4 billion still don't have access to sanitation. So we, we, we know this is a critical public health thing, but we, we haven't figured out globally how to, how to, how to address this. So I think we, we've, we've got to find ways to make, get these technologies better used. And I think there will be innovations with, for example, with the, with, with the toilet uh, that will use less water, that will be great for areas that can't get connected to the sewers or use no water, and find ways to kill the pathogens. And, and actually, the Gates Foundation has some very interesting work going on in that area called reinvent the toilet. So there you have it. <laughs> Um, I want to ask uh, John Vilcino one more question, and then we'll, we'll go to yours if, if there are. Um, you had worked uh, at NASA in jet propulsion in a previous life um, uh, uh, on Earth imaging. This is something most of us growing up in the 60s and 70s could not have imagined. It was a really big deal to have one picture of the Earth uh, in 1969. Now, of course, you can punch up any piece of the Earth you want every morning. Uh, and you can have it fed to yourself if you don't believe, if you don't want to go back. Um, uh, we did a story at Time a few months ago about how George Clooney and Matt Damon have, have a private satellite focused on one particular part of the South Sudanese border, and they're just watching one bad guy. Um, this would have been, this is inconceivable to us even a decade ago. Talk to me a little, if you can, about uh, where the edge of innovation is in that field and what's happening. Uh, and what are you excited about, uh, even though I know you were a bit more removed than you were before? Well, I think um, what's, to me, the most interesting thing about, uh, about satellite imaging these days is, uh, thanks to the internet, we have these images available to just everybody. Uh, and so the ability to sort of crowdsource the analysis, uh, that's what's really new. I mean, the, the, the abil satellite images that we get today aren't dramatically different in character in general than what we got five or, or 10 years ago. Uh, and so that's, in some sense, very different from the, the smartphones we have today are dramatically different from the smartphones we had five or 10 years ago. But what we have today, which is very different, is the ability to engage with and interact with this information in this pooled manner. And so um, one of the fascinating aspects of creativity and innovation generally, not just with respect to satellites, but it applies to satellites, is this ability to, to crowdsource and to collaboratively do things on just incredible scales, sort of this, you know, collaborative innovation that can involve not teams of five people, but 5,000 people or 500,000 people. And satellite imagery is, is one way where, uh, where we've seen some really, really interesting uses of, of the data, but one of only many, of course. Okay. Um, I have many more, but I don't want to, I don't want to, this, this panel can be crowdsourced itself. Um, <laughs> and uh, it would be foolish to leave all the analysis in one person's hands. Uh, so I'm going to uh, take a risk here and bet that someone wants to ask either of our panelists uh, something. Um, you can direct, direct it to either John. Just don't direct it to me. Yes, sir. <coughs> yes, my name is Don. Yes, 
Uh, my Chelsea name is or... Donald Barnes. I'm from South China University of Technology in Guangzhou, China. Uh, I'm, we noticed in the news this week uh, <clears throat> about uh, the water pollution that has taken place in the past in Camp Lejeune uh, and uh, the paper of yesterday or today about the lead in the D.C. water. Uh, do you envision a time when we would have a mobile <clears throat> device where we could uh, test our water before we drink it? I'm, I'm sure that it's possible. Uh, it's a little high tech for the work that we do, which is really around basic uh, service delivery. But the, there, are, there are increasingly very sophisticated water technologies out there. If you go to any of these, uh, the World Water Forum, for example, the, the kind of technology that exists now to A, analyze what's in water and, and is, is incredible. However, I th those technologies remain super expensive. So to do it on the household level, I think would still be, it, there's a long time before that's gonna happen. What we are trying to find is ways to do basic water quality analysis for much cheaper. So for example, that's one of the weaknesses that we've identified in our monitoring with mobile phones, is that we don't do a good enough job on actually uh, looking at the water quality uh, in, in all of these points that we've, uh, that we've put in place over the years. Um, and so what we're, what we're now doing is looking at, and there's a, actually a $5 kit now that you can actually have that will be, that you can test the water to, you know, to get basic, the, you know, the, not, not these, again, not these heavy metals or these types of, of, uh, of things that you're talking about, but uh, the, the basic, make sure that the water is healthy enough to be, to be drinking. Something about that question had made me thirsty. I don't know what it was. I know. Thank you. <laughs> Someone else? In the back. Hello, um, Pat Austria from the World Bank. Um, so I was wondering, we can all agree that there are so many inventions out there, um, but are there any problems or challenges with having invention become so rampant? For example, less collaboration or the truly game-changing inventions aren't rising to the surface because there's so many coming out? Uh, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, so um, I think generally rampant invention is a good thing. Um, right, you'd want to have. In fact, I would argue that it's a necessary thing, right? In order to have the, you know, the five or ten or hundred incredible inventions, you're probably going to have to have a few thousand that are pretty good, and you know, a few tens of thousands that maybe don't don't matter as much. Um, but I think uh, it, it creates very real on the ground challenges for uh, organizations like national patent offices, right? So if you're the USPTO, then you're charged with this incredible incoming flood of, of patent applications, and uh, it is a very, very uh, difficult job to really understand which one of those you know, deserve patent protections and, and which, which one of them don't. So I think uh, there are burdens there. I'd also say that the market does play a role, not always a perfect role, but in general a, a positive role in helping to select, right? So, so people who start, who invent something and then start a company, and if, if they really are meeting a market demand, a market need, you know, the world isn't perfect, it doesn't mean that, you know, there's 100% correlation, but there is a correlation. So I think the market plays a, a good role in, in helping to sift out the value, the value of inventions. But rampant invention is, 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 a, is a good thing. We certainly don't want to reduce in, in, innovation. Now that we've established that we have it, because I was going to ask you if it was accelerating, it was my impression that it was accelerating, now that we've, I think, established that it, it is, can you just talk a little bit more, John, about, about why, dig a little deeper into the reasons. I was, I was, I was pretty general at the top as to, about computational and educational and, you know, regional barriers, but is there, is there uh, other factors that we need to just put on the table here uh, that explain um, the word rampant, which I thought was great? Well, I think, I think there's a general, uh, in, in Folks may disagree, but I think there's a general global move towards entrepreneurship. I think there's a greater uh, appreciation of the value of entrepreneurship, uh, not all, in, in really almost every country in the world, and, and really almost an inevitable consequence of being an entrepreneur is thinking about what can you do that's that's new and innovative to to satisfy a market need, or perhaps even create a market where there wasn't one, and then meet that new market that you've created, mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of what happened with you know personal computers. So. Um, I, and I think that leads to uh, increased interest in creating. And, and it also s sounds to me like um, that there is a personal um, motivation at, w at work here in invention. It's not merely curiosity. There's also a, an element of this which is which is just um, uh, individual uh, um, 
uh, ambition. Yeah, I think I think that's and I, I agree, and that's and that's not, of course, new. We've had that. You know, Thomas Edison was famously, in fact, in the Time Magazine article uh, on the Qualcomm Time Survey, you talked about that quite a bit. And, um, that's always been a, a key driver. You know, ambition to create something, to to create something new, as well as hard work. And lack trial of sleep. and error. Right, right. So it, as, as, <laughs> Luck. Yeah, as we learned from that article, Thomas Edison didn't sleep very much, right? right. <laughs> it's quite something. Uh, other questions? Yes, sir, in the in here. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Fred Altman. I'm retired. And one of the big advantages of all the mobile phones is you're able, or mo mobile devices, is you're able to gather tons of data. But to, to make any of that useful, you, uh, there needs to be a lot of analysis. And we've gotten to the point with big data, et cetera, and analyzing it. And our, uh, it, um, is the back end, the analysis end, getting as much attention as the front end, the mobile devices themselves? I think you get that one. Okay. Well, yeah, I th I, it's a great question. I, big data is is recognized as a as one of the um, preeminent challenges of, of of the time. I think it is getting a lot of uh, attention. Um, that said, there's an enormous amount uh, amount more to do, um, and I would say that uh, we've seen some great examples already. I mean, for example, I've I've read that people are are able to use, for example, internet search queries to figure out where there are clusters, perhaps, of disease outbreaks, right? Which would have been you know, impossible to, to, to find out uh, years ago. Um, and of course, the US government has funded and is funding some major initiatives um, built around big data. Um, but it's an incredibly hard problem. If you read any of these statistics about the amount of data being created, and there are these stunning things like, you know, every week there's enough data created that you'd have to, if it was HDTV, you'd have to watch it for a gazillion years. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just incredible. So I'm sure that we're, we're leaving a lot on the table in terms of information that were we able to know how to get there and look at it, we'd be able to figure things out. But pe good people are working on it, and that's an opportunity for innovation and invention right there is big data analysis. If I can just jump in, I, I think it is about tracing it back to what is the impact that you're trying to, to solve in some particular area, and then making sure that you're using that data to actually make decisions and improve what you're doing versus just having the data. Because I think that's a, you know, that's a big question that you know, we, we, we see in the international development space a lot, is we've got a lot of data on what governments are doing, you know, what money they're spending, but are, are we taking that a step further and saying, okay, we, we're trying to reduce global poverty here. How are we really t using that data to, to help us make decisions, whether we're on track or off track in that area, and, and make the necessary improvements to get better? And John Sauer, what, what else, how do we ensure that the rampant innovation that we're talking about here doesn't just run to developed nations and developed nations' problems? The, so much of what we think about in this realm is about technology and is about, rightly or wrongly, consumer technology. Um, uh, and it's, and it's uh, since we're bombarded by all the new things we can do with all of our devices, how do we make sure that the inventive culture uh, extends to problems that most of us don't have, um, things we take for granted, uh, that other people in other places have uh, in rampant um, scale uh, without so many of these other uh, wonderful th uh, uh, assists, uh, technological assists that we've got growing, uh, grown accustomed to. How do we make sure that the policies about, uh, that sort of are designed to foster invention actually uh, treat problems that we really don't have but other folks do? I think that would make a great Time Magazine story, actually. No, uh, but the, the, the reality is that it w we do need to look at, you know, how those inventions are, are I, I think it's around, re we have to rethink actually how we're doing international development because it's got to not be about you know, the, the infrastructure first per se, but about facilitating this type of effort to happen. So I look at our own role at, at Water for People. You know, 10 years ago, all we were doing was putting boreholes in the ground in, in communities. Now we're, we're, we really, our role is much more around facilitating to build the capacity amongst district governments so that they can spend the money that national governments have 
and, all, of course, and do monitoring too as well. Uh, but, and, and that's a big step change. And, and I think that's the kind, so it's really around that facilitation role. So how do we do things like support more entrepreneurship development you know, to solve certain challenges? And we're doing that with, that's what we're doing, for example, with sanitation is we're doing a lot of work to bring new entrepreneurs into the sanitation space where if we weren't doing that, no one, no one else is going to be, no, no one else is focusing on that. So it is around, I think, rethinking how we do international development overall, because I think that the way we've done it hasn't gotten the results that we want, and that's about better monitoring to understand that, but it's also then about that role of facilitation, I think, versus doing direct implementation. Do you and have I, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no. Uh, do you have a, uh, can you talk about maybe one success story where you've actually uh, identified an entrepreneur or at least an area where you think that um, you've had some success in um, in getting from idea to uh, yeah, uh, so application? Yeah, so one of the inventions in this space or the, it has been this device called the Gulper, which is actually a, a bilge pump essentially for for pit latrines because in a lot of the informal settlement areas you don't you can't get in a uh, exhauster truck or a cesspool truck you know they're too big they don't fit down the narrow ar ar alleyways so we've actually developed this innovation or this invention let's say called the gulper then entrepreneurs can now take this device and empty someone's pit latrine so that it can continue to be used and it doesn't continue to pollute the environment. So I think, you know, again, that's very low tech, but mm -hmm. it's an important invention. And it's, and it, and it's allowed these businesses, uh, we've, we've got you know, several of these in, in the few countries that we work in in, in Africa that are quite successful. And right where now. did it come? Can you talk a little bit more about its provenance? How it the, came uh, about? The Gulper itself? So uh, bilge pump that you it's a bilge pump you, it's a for, souped up bilge pump. For for poop, yeah. <laughs> so, it's a glamorous topic. We're yes. gonna stay with this as long as we can. Again, a, a good time magazine article, something on shit would be did nice. It, did, it, did, did, did it start it's here or did this, was it someplace else? Uh, no, I it started in it started I, I believe in Tanzania was where it first got uh, its footing. Uh, one of my colleagues who I work with, he uh, was at the London School of Economics at the time. I think he started to, to, to see this need that all these pits were full and he started to say, okay, how do we, you know, and, and he's got a lot of friends that are engineers, so he came up with a, a bilge pump for, for, this, for this issue. So it's, it, was, it, it did come locally more, but you know, he's a, he's a Brit, but still, um, it, it was definitely developed to meet a local, a local need. So I, one thing I can add just to the question, to the question about uh, stimulating invention globally, not just in the developed economies, is I think uh, intellectual property systems uh, play a really important role in that. And so um, I think you'll, you're seeing more and more in developing countries a recognition um, of the need to have to put in place and to make to put into practice uh, strong intellectual property uh, protections. And I think when and when that happens, I think there's a direct correlation between confidence uh, that your invention will in fact be protectable. Uh, and and then you know the energy invested and the money invested to create inventions. So I think uh, that's all moving in a very positive direction, and that's that's an important component as well. I don't I, think the gulper has a patent, by the way. <laughs> I knew that when we started down this alley, we might end up there. But I thought well, this panel needs to get down to the weeds of the problems. Yes, sir. <laughs> Does mobile ev evidence from mobile users who might be providing sort of in feedback on the quality of services, do you think that can play a role in sort of uh, breaking down some of those barriers to entry? So your first question, no, we, we don't, in the countries that we're working in, we don't see any resistance. In fact, the, the public utilities are very excited to work with us on this because they know that they cannot 
address this problem themselves. And they're quite good partners, to be honest. And, and clearly, we would you know, the end goal is we would love it for everyone to have a connection to a sewage. And that's what we're aiming for. But I think the reality is that that's very costly. So we need some other types of solutions. We need you know, perhaps decentralized systems. We need some of this. Uh, we still need these other entrepreneurs to take, take to play the role that they're playing. So no, in that, in uh, we don't see any resistance from from the from the public sector. In fact, they're quite keen partners. And your second question, was, I, I think my answer would be yes. There definitely is a role to play, and we're we're already we're already doing that. We we are using mobile technology to do surveys and uh, and also engaging in customer feedback, which at this point is a little bit more um, qualitative. But I think there's. Going forward, there probably will be a need, or, or, or it will be valuable to do a bit more of that on a on a wider scale. So I think the answer is yes. The mobile can for sure play a role in that. Obviously, government funding and backing has had a, a role in some great big inventions in our history. The internet, right? Just just pick one. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's also true that. Uh, Perhaps they can get the government can get in the way. Uh, can you just give us your take on whether we have the mix right now? I think I think we're doing a pretty good job. I you know I think uh, you know uh, government government has played a really incredibly important role and 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 is continuing to do so. Um, I think the it's it's hard to make it's hard for anyone I think to say do we have the mix right now because if you I think the internet was the first message was sent I believe it was 1969 I may be wrong about that but it was about then now if, if we had a panel like this in 1971 and you'd said hey is the government doing the right things I wouldn't have been able to say hey we got the internet two years ago you know it, we wouldn't have known yet and so in some sense the answer whether we're doing the right things today is is, is not going to be is not going to be obvious for we don't know really um, but all indications are that you know this country continues to enjoy a, a very healthy mix of government funding for research that then creates, in many cases, uh, innovations and some, sometimes specific patentable inventions, uh, and of course a, a robust private sector with venture capital investments and investments made by companies like Qualcomm reinvesting their uh, their revenues into into inventive activities and so on. So I, I think the mix um, you can always tune it a little bit, but but it's. It's, uh, in general, I think uh, it's working quite well. You opened the door there, John. Sorry. If you had the dial on your dashboard and you could turn one up, one thing, or one or two things there, what would you turn up or turn down? It yeah, sorry, you can go anywhere you want. No, I, th I think I think you know the system isn't fundamentally broken. Um, I do worry. Um, um, since you brought it up, I do worry there is a, a growing, in some sense, anti-intellectual property climate among some among some quarters, and, and I worry that that the pendulum can swing too far uh, against intellectual property rights, and and you know if that gets reflected in 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 you know well-intentioned uh, legislation that could then impede I innovation, that that could be a, that could be a concern as well. So that that climate is out there, and I, I sometimes. Uh, Worry that the, that, it, that the, the balance could be could could be changed. Okay. Uh, could, could yeah, I jump you you yeah. had a you you asked before about how how can we get some of these inventions to shift into developing countries yeah. where where the problem is, and I think the the role of government in that and it kind of piggybacks on the other gentleman's question is is really important, and I think that's another area that we could try to perhaps advocate or shift or support by getting the governments not I mean yes they have the regulatory role to play but on the other hand doing playing a more active role not in doing the invention themselves but actually in supporting providing good market intelligence or supporting if providing incentives so that the private sector can do resource re research and development um, in, in those countries, I think would be a really good role for the government to play, and one that's been advocated by WSP, actually, um, which is the Water and Sanitation Program at the World Bank in a recent report on, uh, on, on innovation and, the, and, the, and needs in the sector. So I think what the roles are are important, and, and that would help do, as you said, get, get this moving. If I can just add to that, I think you know, in some of these uh, developing countries, uh, just because, for, for, for example, the number of patent filings may not be as high, doesn't mean there's not an incredible innovation and invention going on. We're doing a, a, a project through the World Economic Forum related to the informal 
IP in the informal economy, and actually this one's focused on India. Uh, and so there's, you know, of course, people in India uh, aren't any less creative or inventive than people anywhere else. And, and you know, just because we, you know, they might not be represented with issued patents or, uh, mm -hmm. or trademarks and things like that, there's, there's still just an incredible amount of innovation. Uh, in, in, in all of these places. So the question is really not, not getting it to happen, but it's really sort of harnessing it and making sure it's properly incentivized and captured and valued. Okay, well, we're nearly out of time, and I do get the last question, uh, unless um, uh, this one just doesn't take up the time. But this is, a, for me, particularly a day of summing up of the year um, uh, as best I'm able, and doing so arbitrarily. I'm going to ask both of my uh, colleague panelists a question I didn't prepare them for, and I'll just give them. I'm going to ask them in a minute to think up what they think their most important invention that or application or innovation that they have seen this year in whatever field they want to uh, pick, and it can be uh, theoretical or practical. I'm just give you a few more minutes to think about that while I talk for about, I just think I need to vamp for 30 seconds or so, so <laughs> you can have an answer. Um, uh, because this is an excellent time at the end of the week. We have the many gadgets of the year series you can, you can download and, and, and best movies and, and all sorts of things. But I, I'm, I'm hoping that in, in a panel of intervention in the, in the, you know, in the middle of December, we, we, both of you can uh, just share with us one um, thing that you, know, you didn't have or didn't know about or uh, hadn't. Uh, weren't excited about it at the beginning of the year that as the year closes, um, you have great hope and prospect for. So, cool. I got one. Good. <laughs> um, so <laughs> one, of my, one of my colleagues in engineering at UCLA is a, a professor named Edegon Azkan. And what he's done is he has, uh, and I don't know if that's actually this year, but he's gotten a lot of attention this year. He's come up with methods to use the imagers, the cameras and cell phones and mobile phones to do mm -hmm. medical diagnostic testing. Uh, and that's getting incredible traction uh, in uh, the developing world because you have you know, these devices that can be used to test for these diseases. And again, this is one of these, who, who would have known 20 years ago that this was out there? So to me, that's, that's an, the, an example of just, it's just an incredible invention that can, you know, has the potential to save just innumerable lives and, and make a real difference using something people already own. Yeah, camera phones can do some pretty incredible things. Like they can count the, the number of, fecal coliform in a petri dish now, so you don't have to count them yourself. You just take the picture and the camera will count it and tell you, you know, if your water is safe to drink or not. Is that a this but, year development? No, it's not, so I just was You're piggybacking me. I did, me. I did, I <laughs> did. No, I, so this is something that I, I just learned about recently, but there's a, an interest, you know, it goes back to this um, collective decision making that, that I think is really critical and important. Um, there's a, there's a, software or a company called Lumio that has developed this kind of collaborative decision-making platform that I just learned about uh, recently and that I think will, could, could be very exciting. We haven't used it yet, but I'm, I think I'm going to use it for a project I'm working on right now. How would it exactly go, do you think? How would it work? So the way that it works is that you, it just, you, you collaborate with a group of people and, you know, we could, do this throughout, you know, we'll do it with people in Uganda and Denver and, you know, in, in the Netherlands and, you know, and it helps you just uh, to make decisions about where you're working with on, on programming, on projects. Um, it gives you a, it, it gives you a way to sort of flag whether, uh, you know, how, how, you know, if, if there's a priority and then when you want to take a, take a discussion to some kind of actual decision making piece and create a and, and create the the get the get the team to actually make some decisions around that so you can actually do all this virtually without having to have a, a meeting or send a 25 emails and I think it's, it's I haven't looked at it too much but it's quite a, it's a quite heuristic platform yeah well great um, We'll need that, I'm sure, the next time we meet. <laughs> um, but for now, uh, we have done our best to give you a tour d'horizon of, uh, of, of, in, of invention uh, in the year 2013 and where we think it's headed. Um, we appreciate your participation. Um, we're going to yield to panel two now. I'm not quite sure how we're going to yield to panel two. Uh, I'm, I'm, <laughs> off we go. Thank you. <laughs>